Thanks everyone for coming. So this is the first, hopefully in a long line of uh, webinars that the Bayes section of SSA is going to present. Uh, I'd like to begin actually with a short little welcome to country. So wherever you are in Australia, we acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of this land. Respect is paid to their elders past and present. Uh, a bit of housekeeping before we actually get started. So during the talk, if you have any questions, I'd like you to go ahead and ask them via the chat if they're small clarifying questions, I'm quite happy to pick up on those and, and feed them to Gail so she can clarify them. If they're bigger issues, I'm gonna ask that you hold on to them till the very end, because at the end, we're gonna have a Q&A session where we're gonna just you know, answer the questions you have and maybe chat for a little bit afterward for those of us that have time. So for those of you who do not know, who don't have the uh, benefit of knowing Gail, Gail is a professor of econometrics at Monash University and she's also now a recent fellow of the Australian Academy of Social Sciences. So her primary interests lie in statistical methods for complex dynamic models and economics finance uh, with the development application and validation of Bayesian simulation based methods really being central to her research, both within an inferential setting and as they pertain to the important ideas of prediction. Her research has been published in some of the most prestigious journals in statistics and econometrics, including Journal of the Royal Statistical Society Series B, Biometrica, Journal of Computational and Graphical Statistics, Journal of Econometrics. In addition to this very nice publication record, she also has a very interesting piece, which is that most of her research has actually been funded by the Australian Research Council. Basically, since 1999, she's averaged about two grants every, uh, every sorry, one ARC grant every two years, including a very prestigious uh, ARC Future Fellowship. So we're lucky enough to have Gail talk to us today about some of her kind of more recent work in the overview of Bayes and how it pertains to the entirety of Bayesian statistics, I guess, in terms of its computational aspect. So with that, I'd like to uh, let Gail take it away. And thank you again for, for giving us this talk, Gail. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, David, for that lovely introduction. Very, very generous. Um, and I'd like to thank David and the whole uh, Bayesian crew, the crew of the Bayesian section for inviting me to give this talk. That was, that was uh, really very nice of them. Um, the history of the talk, uh, excuse the pun, is um, began a couple of years ago, really, when um, I was prompted by a particular invitation to do something that I thought would be very useful, and that is to attempt to synthesize what is really a huge amount of work that's going on in Bayesian computation per se, um, and in particular put some of the newer computational methods into some sort of historical context. So I did that and I gave the talk, that was the easy bit. <laughs> The hard bit was when I decided then to write a paper on the topic. And given the very large scope of what I was uh, attempting, I thought I needed some help. And so David and Christian Robert uh, very kindly agreed to be involved. And we now have um, a paper that's available on archive, which I'm pointing out here simply because uh, that has a lot of the details and the very extensive referencing that sits behind the talk that I'll give today. So we need to start our journey <laughs> and we need to start our journey at the very beginning at what was undoubtedly a cold December day in London 1763 when one Richard Price who was a fellow of the Royal Society presented to the Society an as yet unpublished paper by his colleague the Reverend Thomas Bates who had died a couple of years prior an essay towards solving a problem in the doctrine of chances. I mean, they knew how to title papers in those days. And with that, uh, what, what eventually be, became known as Bayesian inference, or if you like, the Bayesian statistical uh, paradigm, has its first public airing. So what was the problem that Bayes posed in his essay? Well, uh, to our modern eyes, a very, very simple one. If one performs in independent Bedouli trials with a probability of success on each trial theta, 
and one records the uh, sequence of successes and failures in those end trials, what is the probability then, given those observations of theta, the unknown parameter, lying between A and B? And the answer that Bayes gave was simply the integral between A and B of what we would now refer to as the posterior density function for theta, given by what will become known as Bayes' theorem, uh, the product of the Bernoulli likelihood function, a uniform prior on theta, and normalized by the so-called marginal likelihood. So the first application, as far as we know, of this concept of inverse probability, given a set of observations produced according to an assumed anti-generating process, so Bernoulli in this case, can we invert the problem to make a probability statement about the unknown and unobservable theta? So Bayesian inference in our modern language. What's the computational problem? What's the computational challenge in this case? Well, absolutely no challenge in terms of getting hold of that posterior density itself, because that has a closed form solution as a beta density. But Bayes wasn't interested in the density. He was interested in the probability of theta lying between A and B. And that defines the so-called incomplete beta function, which does not have a closed form. And it has been argued that because Bayes could not find uh, and an, uh, accurately compute this integral that did not have a closed form solution, it's been speculated, so this is just speculation, too late to fact check now, as a possible reason for his not publishing his work before he died. So you could say that computational issues have been a feature of Bayesian inference from its birth. <laughs> But before we go any further on Bayesian inference and details of computational matters, let's take a little step back and ask ourselves the obvious question. What is a Presbyterian minister in rural England in the mid 1700s, what's he doing playing around with mathematics and computation? And to answer that question, I think we have to go back two centuries further to the Protestant Reformation, to Wittenberg, Germany, when one pretty feisty and slightly unpleasant monk, Martin Luther, um, nails to the door of a particular church 90, 95 complaints about the established Roman Catholic Church. And with that begins the break from the established Church of Rome. And, of course, the Swiss got in, into the act and John Calvin was, was, was big on that front. And all of whom, of course, were protesting against uh, the, the workings of the established Roman church and in so doing, creating what would become eventually known or eventually the new Protestant churches, which in a nutshell, so three bullet points, uh, involved basically stepping outside the authority of the Roman Pope, advocating a more personal connection with God and, you know, independent of that papal hierarchy, and importantly, allowing ordinary people uh, some say in appointing their own pastors or ministers. Okay, so that's, that's Europe. But what's happening across the English Channel in the British Isles? Well, you know, you've got Henry VIII, he was famously marrying a lot and breaking from the Church of Rome, so he could divorce one wife, marry the next, Anne Boleyn, and of course, famously destroying the Catholic, Catholic monasteries. Now, by the time we get to Mary, his uh, daughter, she kind of swings things back a bit in favour of the Catholics, but with the next gal in line, Elizabeth, she really takes the Protestant uh, uh, thing to, to a serious, uh, serious extent, and it's really under her that the Protestant movement, the English Church of England variety, really takes root in England. Meanwhile, simultaneously further north in Scotland, uh, the more extreme Calvinistic brand of Protestantism spreads and eventually leads to the Presbyterians. <laughs> 
So that means that by the time you get to Bayes' time in the 1700s, you've got this real mix of Presbyterian and Church of England clergy dotted throughout the British Isles, including, of course, our man Thomas Bayes. So that's kind of half the story, if you like, why Thomas Bayes is who he is. But where does the mathematics come into play? Well, I'm going to channel uh, Bill Bryson here and just have a little bit of fun. I mean, you know, there are a lot of these guys, okay, and, and they're all supported by their local community. And, you know, they had a fair bit of time on their hands, <laughs> uh, including time, of course, to explore ideas. And given that, uh, so they were, you know, examples of the, the gentleman scholars of the time, if you like. And given that Bayes had studied mathematics at the University of Edinburgh, it's not surprising that he was playing around with mathematics. Remembering, of course, also that during the 1700s in Scotland in particular, there was a real flowering of ideas and scientific experimentation, the so-called Scottish Enlightenment, that Bayes's education in the University of Edinburgh had thrown him right into the middle of. So what we see with Bayes all makes sense. But whether it be from the stress of numerical computation or not, Bayes dies early. And after that initial presentation and publication of his work by Price under Bayes' name, uh, this idea of inverse probability uh, appears to have pretty much sunk from view until a long comes Pierre, Pierre Simon Laplace, across the channel again in France, who again, as far as we can tell, appears to have independently uh, discovered this concept of inverse probability or Bayes' theorem as it eventually uh, is known, and um, applies this concept to several problems and formalizes it a little bit more and, and so on and so forth. But importantly, along the way, introduces the Laplace approximation to integrals in general, including integrals that we encounter in Bayesian analysis. So really produced the first computational solution to intractable Bayesian problems. But we'll come back to that. Uh, now, from my, my reading of things, um, this concept of inverse probability really remained the dominant paradigm during the uh, 1800s uh, until, of course, as we know, it was really somewhat usurped in the 1900s uh, by the concepts of maximum likelihood estimation and associated sampling properties, and of course, uh, the frequentist uh, properties and concepts of hypothesis testing. And that was really despite there really being um, still important work going on on the Bayesian front by some very well-known names, including uh, the father of econometrics, uh, sorry, the father of Bayesian inference in my field of econometrics, Arnold Zellner. So let's skip two centuries then, from Pierre in the 1770s to Arnold in the 1970s. And let's have a look at the state of play of Bayesian inference in the early 1700, uh, 1970s, sorry, 1970s. And we can do that through the window of Arnold's classic textbook. So what do we see? Well, there are a lot of Gaussian and associated distributions that are adopted as the data generating process which when combined with standard priors produce in the main analytical solutions for the Bayesian posterior and all of its associated quantities. So in other words, the models are being chosen in order to produce typically analytical, uh, analytical solutions for Bayes. Now, there is a uh, an appendix on low dimensional deterministic integration methods. Uh, there's reference to numerical tabulation of common integrals and certainly reference to Laplace's analytical approximation. But nowhere in the text is there a single mention of simulation based computation. However, as we 
move into the late 1970s and early 1980s, things start to change. And the models that people wish to assume to describe reality, so the models they are adopting as the data generating process are becoming more complex and higher dimensional and are precluding analytical Bayesian solutions. And it appears or appeared uh, that neither, neither Bayes armed with deterministic numerical integration techniques nor Bayes armed with a Laplace approximation was really up to the task as a general inferential method. And so things stalled. However, simultaneously, computers were coming online. They were becoming more prevalent and they were becoming more powerful. And so the stage was really set for a true computational revolution driven by simulation-based computational methods. But before we go any further, it's worth clarifying in a little bit more detail exactly what the computational challenge in Bayes really is. The point is that virtually all Bayesian quantities of interest can be expressed not just as integrals, but as integrals that are represented as the posterior expectation of a particular function of theta. So your posterior moments, your marginal posteriors, posterior expectation of a loss function, even a posterior probability is simply the expectation of an indicator function. Predictives, all of these things are simply posterior expectations of a particular function of theta. So Bayes is not just about evaluating integrals, it's evaluating integrals that have a, 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 an interpretation as a posterior expectation. And only when we assume simple models, simple data generating process, processes and standard priors, will those integrals, i.e. those expectations, have a closed form solution. So for most empirically realistic models, they will not, and we will have to estimate those expectations. And there are three main ways of doing that. Sure, we can bring in our deterministic numerical integration methods, our Simpson's rule, trapezoidal rule, Gaussian quadrature. Sure, absolutely fine for low dimensional problems. But given that a multiple integral is, of course, computed essentially as a multiple sum, the computational burden is exponential in the dimension of the problem. And that means that the computational burden becomes basically infeasible for anything other than a pretty low dimensional problem. So on their own, these deterministic numerical integration methods are kind of out the window. Your stochastic simulation or sampling methods, on the other hand, are not only much more feasible, they're a really natural way of thinking about the estimation of an expectation. Okay, think about it. All we have to do is to be able to draw theta from this probability distribution, transform those draws into draws of G, and simply estimate the population mean, i.e. the expectation, with a sample mean. I mean, what could be simpler? And of course, we have control over the number of draws. So for a large enough number of draws, uh, we can act, uh, you know, essentially produce an estimate of that expectation that is exact, i.e. we can conduct exact Bayesian inference up to simulation error, so up to the hat. Whereas approximate methods only ever aim to produce an approximation to the expectation of interest. And they'll do that in a number of different ways, as we'll see. So for example, okay, they might produce an approximation to the posterior itself, and then use draws from that approximate posterior to produce a simulation-based estimate of this approximation to the expectation of interest. But, all such methods will only ever produce an approximate estimate of the expectation. So, even before we know any details 
kind of ask the question, why would we think about using anything other than what I'm calling an exact simulation technique to evaluate a, a, a Bayesian problem? They have avoid the extreme curse of dimensionality of deterministic methods. They avoid the intrinsic approximation error of the approximate methods, and they're intuitively simple. I mean, whatever their details, as you will see, all of these methods will simply use a sample mean potentially weighted draw of, of posterior draws of g of theta to estimate the population mean. And you know, the simplest type of activity that we ever undertake in statistics. What's the hard bit? <laughs> the hard bit is getting representative draws from that posterior distribution. And that difficulty really lies at the heart of the whole literature on Bayesian computation and all of its developments, including the developments of the new approximate computation methods. Yeah. So let's have a little bit more of a think then about this issue of simulating from a Bayesian posterior distribution so that we can understand and try and understand why it's so hard. Okay, well, if we can get our hands on an independent sample from the posterior, that's clearly ideal. Uh, each new drawer is bringing fresh information about the posterior, and hence we're going to have ultimately an accurate estimate of the expectation of interest. So Mon Monte Carlo sampling, of course, produces an independent sample from the posterior directly. And that's ideal. When the posterior itself is of a standard form and can be simulated, but the expectation is not. Think of Bayes, that is exactly the situation he was in. He had a probability that did not have a closed form solution, but he could have expressed that as the expectation of an indicator function and then simulated from the beta posterior distribution and estimated his probability as the sample mean of the indicators or in other words, as the proportion of M draws of theta that lie between A and B. So Monte Carlo simulation would have been a feasible solution to Bayes' problem. If only he'd had a laptop on his pulpit, he would have been fine. <laughs> okay, but you know, complex models, of course, yield complex likelihood functions and ultimately lead to posteriors that are non-standard. Okay, first red box. For empirically realistic models, posterior distributions cannot be simulated from directly. Okay, so enter stage right, important sample. Another very simple idea, okay, introduced actually by a couple of uh, Dutch econometricians uh, into the literature, uh, really exploiting in an explicitly Bayesian setting a computational method that had been introduced a couple of uh, decades earlier. Simple idea. Find a density distribution, let's just say, uh, Q, that's a good match for P, but from which we can sample. Easy to show that you can then use the draws from that so-called important sampling Okay, so the draws of g of theta and produce a weighted mean estimate of the expectation of average uh, of, of interest. These weights here are then the ratio of okay, a kernel of the problematic density here. Okay, so you can see that even though we do not have to be able to simulate from P, because we only ever simulate from Q, we do have to be able to write P down up to its integrating constant. And given, of course, the posterior via Bayes' theorem is proportional to the product of the likelihood and the prior, to implement, gives, uh, implement important sampling, we have to be able to write down the data generating process, we have to write down the probability density ordinate or the probability associated with the data generating process, i.e. we have to be able to write down the likelihood function. Remember that. So, problem solved. 
Yes, as long as we can find, write down the likelihood function we're in business. Well, not quite, because we still kind of hit up against this issue of dimension. Because intuitively, you can see it's going to be difficult to find a good match Q to P when theta is of high dimension. And even without knowing all the details, again, intuitively, you can see that the important sampling estimator of that expectation is going to be an accurate estimate if Q is a good match to P. Okay, light bulb moment. Why not break a high dimensional problem down into a sequence of lower dimensional problems. And that's exactly what happened when these guys introduced the concept of Gibbs sampling into the literature. Again, another simple, but in this case, case utterly revolutionary idea. It's hard to sample either directly via Monte Carlo sampling or indirectly via important sampling from a complex joint high dimensional posterior. However, it's easier to sample from the associated lower dimensional and potentially much simple conditional posteriors. Why? Well, you know, conditioning always makes life easier because we're treating something that is unknown. We're treating it at least temporarily as if it's known. And of course, working with the lower dimensional conditionals they're easier things to work with because they're lower dimensional. So let's think about uh, two blocks of parameters defining our joint posterior. Gibbs sampling involves iteratively drawing those two blocks from their two associated conditionals. And under regularity, that will yield draws from the joint posterior that we're after. What's the cost? Well, that iterative or sequential sampling via the conditionals creates dependence in the sample of draws, i.e. Markov chain dependence with an invariant distribution that's equal to the posterior distribution of interest, i.e. Gibbs sampling is an example of a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. And because of that dependence, we've got to work harder. We've got to verify the conditions for convergence. We've got to monitor the conditions for convergence. And, you know, basically, we need more draws to produce the same level of accuracy as an independent sample. But once we've got the draws and we've established that we've converged, okay, we do the same simple things, i.e. we estimate the expectation with the sample mean of the draws. And we just modify the simulation standard error formula to cater for the dependence or reflect the dependence in the draws. So Gibbs sampling is a very good starting point in many complicated models, exploiting the simplicity that comes from conditioning. Take, for example, a state-space model where we have a certain set of what we might call static parameters, your usual little fixed parameters, and your huge, normally huge number of random latent parameters. Well, that's going to give you a joint posterior that's certainly not amenable to analytical treatment or treatment via deterministic numerical integration. But the conditional posterior for the static parameters conditioned on the states is often closed form. And the distribution for the latent states conditional on the static parameters is amenable to filtering techniques, including the Kalman filter. So we gain a, an enormous amount of simplicity and tractability by going via the conditions. But that also kind of gives you twigs and think, okay, what about this idea of actually introducing artificially introducing auxiliary latent variables that are not intrinsic to the model just in order to produce tractable conditionals and integrate them out via the Gibbs procedure and retain draws just on the parameters you're interested in. And that whole idea of so-called data augmentation was introduced independently by Tanrin Wong, uh, independently from this introduction of, of Gibbs sampling, but in tandem 
with it. Okay, red box time. To implement a pure Gibbs sampler, we need obviously for those conditionals to be tractable enough or standard enough for us to be able to simulate from them directly. And certainly for that to be the case, we need to be able to write down the likelihood function. However, writing down the likelihood function is uh, a uh, necessary but not sufficient condition for all of those conditionals to be standard. Okay, typically not all of the conditionals will be standard and hence able to be drawn from directly. Okay, for example, the conditional for the states given the static parameters in a non-linear state space model, just for example. Trick, draw from the problematic conditional indirectly by inserting into Gibbs another MCMC algorithm, namely the so-called Metropolis Hastings algorithm, which um, just as a little historical aside, um, actually had its genesis of way before Gibbs, or let's just say before Gibbs, uh, with the, the physicists involved in the uh, Manhattan Project and was extended in 1970 by Hastings, hence the name. Um, really, again, as a generic um, computational method, not anything to do with Bayesian, solving Bayesian problems per se. Um, and we have a little bit more discussion about that, of course, in the paper. But in terms of our current story here, the beauty of inserting an MH algorithm inside Gibbs is that magic happens and the hybrid chain, so to speak, still has as its invariant distribution, the joint posterior that we wish to sample from. So the thrust of the MH within Gibbs algorithm, and let's just use our little example here of the states given the, the static parameter, okay, is to again, draw from that prob problematic um, uh, conditional indirectly via what's called here a candidate distribution, which again is chosen to be a good match to that problematic conditional. And you can see immediately the dimension reduction benefits that we have gained via Gibbs, because now we're only having to do that matching on the lower dimensional conditional, yeah, than if we had tried to do some sort of matching on the uh, full joint. We then accept that candidate draw with a probability that depends on this ratio. And this ratio depends on a kernel of the problematic conditional, so again, we have to be able to write that conditional down up to its integrating constant. And to do that, we have to be able to write down the likelihood function. So you can see there, there's, there's a theme here. <laughs> All of the methods so far require us to be able to evaluate or write down the likelihood function. And you're thinking, well, you know, so what? Yes, isn't that always the case? Well, no. <laughs> I mean, what about if we have a data generating process that cannot be expressed as a probability or a density ordinate? Okay, just throwing up some examples at, at you there. Um, or if the dimension of the data is so large that evaluation of the n terms that comprise this joint probability density function here, and remember that has to happen at each point in the Gibbs iterations or MCMC iterations, that the data is so large in, 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 in size that that is essentially an infeasible computation. Well, for some problems, the rescue is going to come via an unbiased estimate of that likelihood function and so-called pseudo marginal MCMC which again is another really beautiful idea, really simple idea. So let's say we have an estimate of the likelihood function. Okay, details are going to be specific to the problem. But let's say that estimate has been somehow constructed from, and you can see there back, this vector of auxiliary random variables that has been introduced into the problem in some way or sits within the problem in some way, okay? to produce an estimate of the likelihood function that is, under an expectation with respect to you, unbiased. Okay, now let's take 
the U out of the hat. So U has created the estimate and let's make the dependence of that estimate on U explicit here. Condition explicitly on U. And then let's just apply the data augmentation trick. Augment the set of unknowns with this auxiliary vector U and apply an MCMC scheme to the augmented space. And then simply select the draws on theta, discard the draws on U, they've done their job, in order to conduct marginal inference about theta. And of course, where does the word pseudo come from? It comes from the fact that we're basing an MCMC scheme on an estimated not a true marginal, uh, a true likelihood function, hence pseudo marginal. That's where the words come from. But does it work? Do, do we still have um, as the invariant distribution of the Markov chain, the, the, the distribution we're interested in? And the answer to that question is yes, due to the magic of the unbiasedness of the likelihood function. And it only takes a little bit of simple algebra to show that, and that's in the paper. Now, the benefit of these pseudo marginal methods is that they can release the burden of having to evaluate all components of the likelihood function. Plus, they can reduce the computational load associated with estimating the full likelihood function in the big data case, when the dimension of the data is very large. By as you would guess, using in a, in a clever way, uh, a subsample of the data to produce an unbiased estimate of the full likelihood function. And then via the pseudo marginal trick, uh, eventually producing, uh, you know, legitimate draws from the posterior distribution of interest and hence producing ultimately an exact, up to simulation error, exact estimate of the expectation of interest. Okay, so are we done? <laughs> all done yet? Oh, are we there yet, Mum? Okay, well, uh, you know, we've got all these, all these, all these methods now that are all in one way or another uh, enabling us to produce an estimate of the expectation uh, that is exact up to simulation error. Do they cover all bases? Well, not quite because we still have to be able to conduct inference uh, in uh, situations where the likelihood function is intractable in a way that simply precludes the use of exact, include, including pseudo marginal methods. Or indeed, in situations where the dimension of the unknowns is so large that exploration and marginalization via an exact method like MCMC is very, very challenging. Or indeed, if there's no expertise in the room to produce a finely tuned, efficient, exact algorithm, because these MCMC algorithms are not black box algorithms. Well, in any one of these cases, uh, we may have to resort to an approximate inference method, uh, an approximate computational method. Okay, and hence produce, yes, approximate inference. So methods that either target an approximation to the expectation of interest by approximating the posterior itself. So that's your approximate Bayesian computation or ABC, Bayesian synthetic likelihood and variational base. Or methods that target an approximation to the expectation by approximating the full integrand. So that's your Laplace and his modern variant, so-called Inla. So let me take you on a 10 minute whirlwind tour <laughs> of approximate computation, beginning with my favorite, ABC. So question is, what sort of approximation of the posterior itself? does ABC produce? Well, there are many variants of ABC, but the simplest form is very simple to explain and understand. Simulate M draws of the unknowns from the prior. For each one of those draws, simulate pseudo data from the assumed data generating process, and then accept or reject those draws of theta depending on the proximity of the simulated data to the observed data Y. 
Now, obviously, z and y are of dimension n, so they're large. And typically what happens uh, is that those vectors are mapped down into a much lower uh, vector of summary statistics. And the comparison then happens on the basis of the summary statistics using a particular measure of distance and, of course, choosing the particular tolerance. Now, the point is that the, the selected draws here, at least as epsilon goes to zero, are draws from the probability distribution for theta conditioned not on the full data set, but conditioned on the summary statistics, i.e. ABC is producing draws from this particular approximation to the exact posterior, where the exact posterior, of course, is P of theta given Y. So that means that we can take those draws and we can use those draws to produce a simulation-based estimate of this particular approximation to the expectation of interest, where the expectation here now, of course, is also conditioned on some reason. What do, you, what do you notice about the computational requirements? Nowhere do we have to write down the likelihood function. All we have to be able to do is simulate from the assumed data generating process. And that's why ABC is so powerful uh, in problems in which we can simulate the process but not write down the likelihood function. However, in practice, those sorts of problems <laughs> are going to be problems in which we do not have access to sufficient statistics. So whatever summary statistics we use, they are not going to be reproducing the information content in the full vector of data. And so, <coughs> sorry, the selection of those summaries and you know, how close we can ever hope to get to the exact posterior via ABC is obviously critical and you know, a big area of research. And in fact, very recently, uh, these issues have prompted people, including David, uh, to start thinking about matching Y and Z without summarization, basically by kind of matching their empirical distributions in one way or another. However, summary statistic-based ABC attempts to estimate this posterior via simulation. Now, if you think about it, underneath that, there's a Bayes theorem. There's a Bayes theorem that links that posterior to a likelihood function for the summaries, or defined on or conditioned on the summaries, if you like. So in essence, what ABC is actually doing is estimating that likelihood function. And in the, the simplest except reject version of ABC, it's estimating that likelihood function for the summaries using uh, the indicator function. Now, I mention that because Bayesian synthetic likelihood estimates or approximates that same likelihood function, but in a different way. So Bayesian synthetic likelihood takes the likelihood function for the summaries and approximates it as a normal distribution with a mean and a variance covariance matrix that are then estimated by, again, simulating draws of the summaries by simulating from the assumed data generating process for a given value of theta. The draws from theta or of theta, if you like, are then obtained by embedding this estimated or synthetic likelihood inside an MCMC algorithm. And then, of course, taking M draws via the MCMC algorithm to produce an estimate of this approximation of the expectation, which again, in a different way from ABC, conditions on the summary statistics. So pulling all this together a little bit for you, you can see that both ABC and VSL can be seen as, as, as versions of pseudo marginal methods because they're using an estimate of the likelihood function. It's just that the likelihood function and hence inference uh, posterior inference is only ever conditional on the summaries, not the full vector of data, and hence inference is only ever approximate. Yeah. Again, VSL 
does not require us to be able to write down the likelihood function. We only have to be able to simulate for it. Okay, well, while all of this um, activity is going on on the, the simulation, you know, stochastic simulation front, uh, the uh, computer scientists and machine learning guys, they've been beavering away in their own world, talking their own language, and uh, of course, they've been producing their own uh, a very uh, powerful approximation tool, so called variational inference or variational base, which, in the spirit of uh, calculus variations, uh, involves approximating the posterior by some Q, and where in its simplest uh, form that Q minimizes the cool black lead uh, deviation from P. And then, of course, once you've got that Q, you can use that Q to produce uh, an approximation to the expectation of interest, where the approximation now is based on this particular approximation to the posterior. Okay. So you can see that approximating that posterior via simulation is replaced by approximating it via optimization. So clearly there is a trade-off here between choosing Q to be flexible enough to capture the features of the posterior, but enabling uh, Q, the variational family from which Q is chosen to be tractable enough to enable efficient optimization. The, the key thing here is though that the uh, VB is advantageous, uh, advantageous um, in particular when the dimension of the unknowns is very large. And that's where some of your simulation based methods, whether exact or approximate, can struggle. So I mean very large, tens, hundreds, thousands in dimension. Problem is, of course, we can't, <laughs> well, you know, it's obvious, we can't implement variational bays directly in that way by minimizing the cool black lever deviation between Q and the posterior that we're using Q to estimate. Okay, but a little bit of simple algebra shows you that minimizing that cool black lever distance is equivalent to maximizing this expectation. And this expectation involves the joint distribution of y and theta, and of course the joint distribution is simply the product of the data generating process, the likelihood function and the prior, and it is available on the assumption that the likelihood function is available. Just by the way, I thought it was worth mentioning this, this expectation here actually provides a lower bound on the log of the so-called marginal likelihood. Okay, or evidence as the computer scientists call it, um, and therefore is used in practice as an approximation to the marginal likelihood, which is the absolutely key quantity used in Bayesian model choice, and is one of the harder integrals in, in, in um, uh, Bayesian analysis to deal with. And I haven't actually touched on this, and you can see actually that this integral that defines the uh, marginal likelihood is not a posterior expectation, it's a prior expectation. And it would typically be um, approximated as an additional step in any simulation based setting. But in variational Bayes, it kind of just falls out as a byproduct. Yeah. But to get the whole thing up and running, you could see we had to be able to write down the likelihood function. But things are moving, people are getting clever. Now there is some mixing and matching that is starting to happen with all of these methods. So variational methods combined with pseudo-marginal methods, variational methods com combined with synthetic likelihood methods, variational methods combined with ABC. So all of these things are, by combining all of the, the best of all of these different methods, are loosening up the requirements on the tractability of the likelihood function at the same time as accommodating via the use of variational Bayes principles, a very, very large set 
multiple unknowns. So you can see there's a real synthesis going on now in the literature uh, to the extent that in the revision of the paper that we're working on at the moment, we actually have a whole section on hybrid methods and a section where we compare ABC with BSL. So we're really trying to kind of pull all of this uh, together um, because that's what's happening in the literature. People are actually using the best bits of all of these different uh, methods. All right, but to finish our journey on uh, the approximate methods at least, we have to go back almost right back to the start to our man Pierre Laplace because we kind of left him hanging. <laughs> and because at the same time as ABC, Bayesian synthetic likelihood and variational Bayes, have been chugging along with great energy, there's a whole fourth stream of approximate methods uh, that has been, uh, has been uh, developed that builds on uh, Laplace's original idea for approximating an integral, which was a very, very simple idea. So using generic notation involves just taking this integrand and rewriting it like this, and then just taking a second order Taylor series expansion of f around its mode and recognizing that we have the integral of a kernel of a normal density function which has a closed form solution. Noting here that we require optimization with respect to the argument of the integral. So building on that very old idea uh, that was actually formalized uh, further in the 80s with Tini and Cadain, uh, Howard Rue and Nicolas Chopin uh, apply this idea to a very broad class of models, the so-called Gaussian process models, which you don't need to know about specifically, but except there's a very, very big class of models that basically nests a lot of the models that we want to deal with, including, say, state-space models. And they do that by uh, creating what they refer to as the integrated method nested Laplace approximation of the posterior and of course any expectation thereof. And they use a combination of nested Laplace approximations in combination with low dimensional numerical integration. So hence the INLA. So you can see that uh, INLA like variational Bayes amounts to replacing uh, simulation by optimization. But the optimization in INLA here is over the high dimensional vector of latent states in the Gaussian process model, and certainly not over the little scalar x <laughs> that Laplace had to deal with. And so there is a whole suite of uh, programs uh, that people use simply in order to be able to perform that optimization effectively. Okay. But as far as I can see, uh, the only INLA around at the moment is the pure version of INLA, which requires evaluation of the likelihood function. I haven't made that clear, but uh, that's, that, that is required. Although I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's no reason why it could not be combined with other methods uh, to allow for uh, uh, an, an intractable likelihood. And perhaps there is some work around like that, but I'm, I'm not aware of that. All right. But, you know, okay, where's MCMC gone? Well, it certainly has not gone to ground, I can assure you. Simultaneously with the development of these approximate methods, there has been a huge amount of work on the exact methods, in particular MCMC. Very, very active still. And it's worth remembering exactly what an, an MCMC method is in order to understand the main goals of all of this uh, activity. Because an MCMC method, first and foremost, is a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. So that means that it takes local dependent steps. So where I am now depends on where I was at the last step. Local dependent steps around the space of theta. Now, you know, your intuition tells you that can be pretty darn slow when the space of theta is very high, where, where, where theta is very high dimensional. 
But Markov chain Monte Carlo is also a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. So the order of accuracy is still uh, M to the minus a half, where M is the number of draws. So you can still, despite the dependence in the draws, make the chain, make your ultimate estimate you produce from the chain as accurate as you wish for a large enough M. Okay, the dependence in the chain, if you like, is affecting the uh, constant term in the order. And it can affect it in a non negligible way, but it doesn't change the fact that it is of order m to the minus a half. So you can arbitrarily, you know, be, have arbitrary accuracy for a large enough m, but of course, each draw entails computational cost. And that's going to be exacerbated when the dimension of the data in particular is large, remembering that we have to evaluate that likelihood function at each iteration in a standard MCMC chain. So all of the newer methods of MCMC are really focusing on being able to scale up well, i.e. to deal with both the high dimensional problems and the big data problems. And we have a whole section in the paper just on these methods, uh, listing and, and, and kind of categorizing them in a particular way. And I'm just throwing up a few examples actually here. Now, of course, I've only spoken about uh, parameter inference or parameter estimation, if you like. Of course, there's a huge amount of work going on uh, in computation for model choice and prediction. And David and I and our colleagues actually spend quite a lot of time on uh, various uh, aspects and paradigms and computation for, for Bayesian prediction. So that's uh, a, a very active area and we, we discussed that in the paper. Plus, most excitingly, uh, some of the newest work is all about computation and the properties of computational methods under misspecification of the data generating process under misspecification of the likelihood function. And David in particular has some very important work on that front, just by the way. Okay, so it's all happening. It's all happening. <laughs> so my last slide is to, uh, you know, phrase the question, pose the question. Where are we going now? What does the future look like? And I ask that question really as someone who um, happily crosses the aisle, to use a political uh, metaphor, um, uh, and, and, and does uh, research in using both frequentist uh, techniques and, and, and approaches and, and Bayesian methods and indeed, you know, melds the two in, in, in some of my work. But despite that open-mindedness, I have to say that I still find the basic principle that lies at the heart of the Bayesian paradigm, namely quantifying uncertainty about what is unknown intrinsically unknown, conditional only on what is known and observed using the language of probability. I find that principle absolutely compelling. And now in particular, given that it's kind of underpinned by the ability to compute any posterior or expectation uh, thereof, you know, whether it be exactly or in some approximate fashion, in almost every imaginable situation. So, you know, is our man Tom <laughs> from 1700s England, uh, you know, with not only the penchant for mathematics, but the time to explore ideas, is he the man for the 21st century and beyond? And I leave you with that question. <laughs> Thank you, Gail, for that for that uh, lovely talk. As, hard, usual, as usual, you give you give fantastic talk. So I'd now like to open the floor to questions from anyone. I'll just ask that you unmute yourself and ask your question, and we'll go from there. So please go ahead and ask away. <laughs> Worn them out. <laughs> Well, then, okay. Well, I'll I'll go ahead and start then with a with a with a question. So, uh, it's a bit odd to ask a question about about this, given that I I am part of this collaboration. It's called a Dorothy Dixon. <laughs> but but one thing I will ask is, 
So yeah. what could you frame, could you tell the audience or why you think Bayes is the paradigm of the 21st century? Oh, well, I, okay. So over and above the fact that I think that the, you know, kind of the, the paradigm, the, the principle of the paradigm is, is convincing. Yes, um, over and above that. So I think that's, to me, that's kind of the core, I think. Uh, it makes absolute sense to me that we would always phrase uncertainty about what is unknown conditional on what we know. I mean, that's just how we, we, we think about life, how we think about uncertainty. Um, but also because now that the problems that we're trying to model as statisticians are becoming more and more complex or people are enabling themselves to tackle more and more complex problems. So with higher numbers of unknowns and larger numbers, of, of larger sets of observations. And when gone is the day when we, you know, a macroeconomist is, you know, modeling 50 observations and that's, that's life. Um, so therefore the problems themselves are getting very complex and the Bayesian computational method lends itself uh, to being able to deal with those problems. So I have phrased this as uh, there being Bayesian problems of computation that have to be tackled and now we have all these solutions. But really there's sitting alongside that is the fact that these models and problems are difficult for any inferential model uh, in any inferential method to tackle. Bayes now has a whole suite of uh, methods that it can use to tackle these difficult models. And I'm not convinced that um, all of the frequentist methods are quite up to the task of dealing with these complex models. Um, and I think that what it comes down to with Bayes is that you, because you're always dealing with uh, a probability distribution, you can always tap into these very fundamental concepts about sampling from probability distributions, okay, or optimizing probability distributions. So in some sense, uh, it lends itself to um, uh, you know, you know, finding computational solutions is kind of, I think, a little bit easier when you're actually always phrasing the computational problems in terms of a probability distribution. Yeah. Is that enough? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. I would definitely say it's a yeah. more holistic framework. I yes, it is a more holistic framework. And I think it's a, a comp, it's a practical framework. And some people would you know, refer to themselves as practical Bayesians. You know, they like the Bayesian computational tools, uh, even if they then use that to, you know, kind of ultimately kind of maximize a likelihood function. <laughs> uh, but I like the, the underlying principle as well as the access to the tools. David, you have a question? Uh, yes, I do, if that's if I'm the David. Uh, You're the David? Uh, One uh, of the original ABC, ABC uh, people, just by the way, for the rest uh, of the uh, Fantastic talk, Gail, that's, that's great. I mean, the only thing is, um, I mean, this is, you know, one of the best sort of synthesis and summaries of it all I've ever seen, but it is incredibly complex and must be sort of daunting for a new person. And I wonder about any, um, you know, does there exist any kind of, you know, flowchart kind of idea of how to guide you to the appropriate Bayesian computation algorithm, or even better, you know, yeah. some kind of AI system for, for choosing the <laughs> right computational Bayesian algorithm for you. <laughs> Well, that's a very good question. And it is indeed an enormous area. And that, of course, is uh, independent of the fact that the Bayesian principles themselves uh, need to be tackled and understood and the specification of prior and all that. So that in itself is a big area. Um, what we have tried to do in the paper is just tackle computation. And we've tried to do that in a way that is hopefully very accessible to people. Yes, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, it's not exactly a flow chart. We've put it into a historical chronology, um, but hopefully in a way that um, enables people to understand where things fit in and therefore where you would use one method over and above another. And most importantly, of course, we provide an enormous amount of referencing to more detailed papers for any one particular computational method. Um, so that's exactly what we've tried to do, in fact, in our particular way, not the only way we could have done it, but, uh, and this is just, this talk here is just giving you a tiny little, you know, kind of 
sprinkling over the top. But uh, the paper is, re we really aim to have the paper be very accessible to people who feel overwhelmed. Okay, can you just remind us, maybe David could put the reference in the chat or something just to remind everyone. It's on the front, oh, okay. Oh yeah, sure, on, it's on, on the front side. Oh, just, just, um, just Google computing bays and it pops up, yeah. I'll also post it in the chat, David. Yeah, thank, thank yeah. We're actually revising it um, at the moment, but it won't change in its essence. We're just, as I said, adding in more of the newer hybrid methods and you know, stuff like that, but it doesn't change in its essence. Um, and uh, hopefully it'll be you know, published at some point, but um, yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's in, and you know, the point is too that all of these different methods, you know, the variational bays, ABC, uh, even just the MCMC world, including the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, you know, all these things operate somewhat in their own little bubble. And that was the other thing we wanted to do was try to synthesize this so people just had some sense of how these things were connected. Um, yeah. So Gail, we have a question from Francis who uh, would okay. like to say, how do you envision education, statistics and data science will change with this paradigm shift? Should we abandon frequentist teaching to a large degree? Oh, gee, I know, it's tricky. Yes, I, I, I'm smiling because, um, you know, 20 years ago, there was a, a, a staff member who wanted to um, completely do that and uh, <laughs> completely uh, up in the whole, undergraduate program and, and put Bayes in from the start. Um, I don't know, I always, I always feel that a university uh, undergraduate program should uh, to some extent lag uh, the literature. I think the literature has to lead and the undergraduate program has to be reflective of, of, of the literature. And it is certainly the case at the moment that uh, overall, I think the frequentist paradigm is still dominating in the literature, in particular in, 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 in econometrics. That is less and less and less so. So I think that over time, things will change. I don't think we're quite there yet, so I think it would be most unfair to kind of start a whole undergraduate program off with Bayes and, you know, and, and in that sense, not be reflective of what, what is happening in the literature. Um, but I, I can see things gradually changing because I, um, I think, as I, you know, as I say, I think the, the, the principle is compelling, the computation is there, you know, what else do you want? Um, but on the other hand, I should just say, uh, I do actually personally quite like the frequentist kind of what if argument, you know, what if we had seen another sample, what would my estimate have looked like, uh, and hence what is the sampling distribution of my estimator. I, I, I quite like that idea, and of course what David and I do in some of our work is we actually look at the, the frequentist principles, oh, the, the frequentist properties of, 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 of Bayesian inference. <laughs> you know, and I, I feel quite comfortable with that, and I certainly feel very comfortable with the idea of thinking about what happens to the properties of my Bayesian inference as the sample size gets larger, i.e. concepts like Bayesian consistency. I am perfectly comfortable with that. So in some sense, we don't have to be one thing or the other. Um, perhaps that's, a, that's the best answer. <laughs> Are there any other? Oh, we have another question from Sama. Hi, Sama. Uh, so Judea Pearl has written the, the book of why, where he describes the science of causality as including Bayesian frequentists, null hypothesis tests, et cetera. Do you think that computation fits within this paradigm or does it have a role at a higher level within this kind of science of causality or do you not have an opinion at this stage? Okay. Um, I see computation as a practical tool, a way of extracting for us in the Bayesian world, extracting the information from the posterior that we wish to, est uh, that we wish to extract. I think that is of second order importance to the paradigm. Of course, it's critical because we need to be able to implement the paradigm. But uh, to me, it sits, you know, alongside the paradigm itself. 
You have to make your decisions about how you think about uncertainty and quantifying uncertainty. And they are the decisions you're making about the paradigm per se of statistical inference. Uh, once you've done that, then you have to access whatever tools are available to actually implement and you know, actually extract, nu extract numerical uh, answers uh, from, your, from your paradigm. So for us, it's from, from the posterior distribution. Yeah. Thank you. I, I mean, I guess this gets somewhat to David's point as well, right? Which is okay. if there there if there's a flow chart of how we think about Bayesian computation, it can't sit above or below the problem we're trying to solve. It has to somehow be integrated. And in the concept of causality, I guess it makes a lot of sense because you kind of have to think of causality as top down or or you know going from bottom to top and computation at either end of that spectrum really really makes really can be easy or hard depending on where you are so i guess mm. it kind of does speak to it being a, a real kind of uh, piece of the of the of the puzzle in a sense yes yes i suppose i have a uh, perhaps it's a slightly old-fashioned view of things you know i i think of models actually as being you know the driving force of everything that we do uh, I think the prize of somewhat second order importance, except perhaps when it comes to the non-parametric world. And I think the models are our way of thinking about how the world operates and, and um, quantifying those in mathematical terms. And so something like causality to me is intrinsically part of the model. And that is how I think about a model to me is then independent of how I think about the inferential approach I use to quantify my, quantify my uncertainty about the model. So that's point one. And then that is somewhat separate or, you know, the, the computation comes in after because of course the computation and what sort of computation I perform depends on the nature and the complexity of the model. Um, so that's how I tend to think about things. But maybe, as I said, that's that's a little bit artificial and a bit old fashioned, I don't know. Um, but that's, that's how I tend to think about things. Are there any more questions? Well, great. If there are no more questions, I'd like to thank Gail once again for delivering a lovely talk. And thank you all for, for coming to this session. Thank you.